Are you challenged by all that's involved with software development? Consider these statistics. The average company needs to use 63% of its software development budget to design and build new software. Nearly one in four companies outsource their software development project. The main reason is cost, although flexibility, speed to market, and access to tools also influence the decision. For those that outsource development, only 17.8% were absolutely satisfied with the work. And the average software development project takes 4.5 months to build and costs around 36,000 US dollars. For a founder with a non-tech background, the time and cost can increase quite dramatically without the right help and guidance. With high failure rates so prevalent in the industry, what can we do to increase the odds of success in our favor? That's where our guest, who is a seasoned CTO, comes in. Hello, and welcome to the Predictable B2B Success Podcast, brought to you by Spratworth.com. And for today, coaching our guest today is Douglas Squirrel. Douglas, you are a seasoned a CTO. I believe you've been coding for something like 40 years and led software 45 teams. 45 now, I'm getting oh, old. Wow. <laughs> and led uh, software teams for over 20 years. Now, I believe you are in a position where you now have empower organizations to use the power of conversation to create dramatic productivity gains across these organizations. Now, your experience with leading software teams as a CTO has occurred in startups, fintech, biotech, music, and everything in between. You've also consulted on product improvement in over 170 organizations in the UK, US, Australia, and Europe, and you've been coaching quite a few leaders, I believe, to improve the conversations, aligning business goals and creating productive conflict. I'm curious. Given... That sounds great. I want to meet this guy. <laughs> given your experiences to date, i sorry, your journey to date, was there a point where you began to realize that you were doing things right compared to most other folk and decided to actually help others do more of the same as well for themselves? Sure. It was when I, it was when I got fired over and over. <laughs> okay. So what happened is the founders of different startups that would employ me would come to me and they'd fire me in this really nice way. And they'd say, Squirrel, you built this amazing team and they're doing a super job and they're being really productive and they get their projects done and there's somebody who leads them and that person really doesn't need your help very much anymore and you're expensive and there's not much for you to do, so why don't you go be wonderful somewhere else? And it was this really nice way of getting told to hit the road, but the fourth or fifth or whatever it was time, I said, there's a pattern here. And it was also getting shorter. So the first one was 10 years and the second one was two years and the next one was a year. And I said, I seem to be able to do this and get faster at it. So maybe I should plan for it. And that's when I became a consultant. And what I do now is um, within two to three months, I will turn around a technology organization and make a, a very radical changes that really improve it. And then I get out of the way, <laughs> which is a good thing. Sometimes I'm around to continue to monitor, but the team doesn't need me in there poking things and changing stuff for very long. And I believe you also run a highly engaged community called the Squirrel Squadron. Nice thing. That is right. You yep. co-authored the book, Agile Conversations from IT Revolution Press, and you run your own podcast as well. But given your journey to date, what would you say though, is your personal area of strength? Uh, having conversations and te te teaching people to have them. The amazing thing is that everyone thinks, I was just coaching someone on this morning, that the solution to your technology problems is the right structure or the right process or getting the right skills or hiring a different outsourced company. Th those are all patches, they're bandages, band-aids on top of what the actual problem is, which typically is a lack of trust, a lack of accountability, fear of error. I have a, I was just talking with somebody yesterday who, whose team is spending all their time trying to avoid mistakes. They want no, no customer to be unhappy. They want no downtime. They want no risk. Hmm. And the person I'm coaching and helping says, I want them to take more risks. Risk would be helpful. It would be very good if in our startup, we tried more things and we failed at more things. I said, but what you haven't done is mitigated the fear for them. You haven't helped to understand hmm. what their fear is and help them to improve in that. We talked about some specific techniques he could use to have a conversation about fear rather than a conversation about whether we should use Scrum or Kanban or something like that, which is not very useful. Hmm. That is a very interesting point in itself because a lot of the conversations we often hear tend to be about process and systems and things of that nature. Those are uh, easier. They're safer. Yeah. It'd be so much nice. If I talk to you about fear, 
we yeah. might have a disagreement and argument and things might be difficult. Right. Whereas if we talk about you know, how many bugs we're going to fix next week, it may be a fantasy. It may not be true, but at least it's easier. Obviously, fear is an issue that needs to be addressed. But is there more to the equation, if I could put it that way, that stops people from looking at what the real issues are? It's their fear and lack of trust typically are the sorts of things that keep people stuck in unproductive relationships, such as a technology team that's trying to avoid so much risk that it never tries anything, which is the problem I was working with my client on yesterday. Trust is the other one we just talked about, fear. And if the trust isn't there between the non-technical part of the business and the technology part of the business, you get them talking at complete cross purposes where the, you hear techno babble from the tech side and they talk about tech debt and scrum processes and high level designs and something else. And all you would like is the feature done so that the customer will pay you and you're speaking in customer terms and they're speaking in technical process terms. This is a common divide that hides a lack of trust because if the two sides trusted each other, they could use the language that they each understood because trust really means understanding the other person's story. Yeah. We just said that there's also the desire, especially from business circles to focus in on tangible outcomes like numbers and being able to track every little, little bit, which it tends to take us away from having conversations, which can be quite intangible and as you said, quite scary. In, yeah, in, there, with, there, there's safety in numbers. Down. Numbers Perfect. make you feel safe, yep. but it doesn't actually work. Certainly. Yep. How do you get people to shift their mindset if they're very much numbers focused or process focused to this idea of even entertaining the fact that it's perhaps the kind of conversations that we have in organization? There are pretty simple ways to make sure that you are tying what you are doing to real outcomes. So the person who says, I, I want to track all the data ha has a good instinct. Their interest is well-placed. Their tactic doesn't work very well. Uh, but a process I call mark to market really helps your tech organization to be accountable for what it's producing in a way that does produce some numbers that are meaningful, but also shows you real progress. Mark to market simply means that just a financial organization might say, we're going to check against the market to see what our holdings are worth rather than imagining they have certain worth. And that's how you get Enron and things like that. If you mark to market carefully and you make sure you know what the holdings are worth when it starts to plummet and you know what to do. So similarly, if you can get your software in front of real customers who might buy it or give you feedback about it or click a button or do something else, and if you can do that very frequently, then you don't have a kind of useless debate about whether you're 60% done or 72% done or whether you've finished the low-level design or something else. Have you added the database index? What you're doing instead is marking to market and checking what the actual market tells you about your software. And if you do, that gets you out into a much different kind of conversation. It may be more threatening. It may be more challenging. Look, we don't have much to put in the market because we don't understand this market very well or our customers don't want to give us feedback or we're building the wrong product. That may be really uncomfortable. That's why people tend to avoid it because it would be dangerous. It would be scary. If you can, if you can get over that and there's some, some techniques you can use to, to get better at that, to practice, then you have a conversation with your technology organization about what they're giving you an account of. Does anybody want this software is really the question you want to ask and, and what will they pay for it? And if you can answer that question frequently and see how it's changing, it's like trading shares instead of buying a house. You know what the the current price is and whether it's moving up or down right away. Mm -hmm. So a couple of questions come to mind. The first of it is this, are you suggesting that as developers, we not just go away with a brief about what to code, but actually communicate directly with customers in order to source feedback? Oh yeah. So one of my favorite things is to make sure engineers are on the customer service phone lines, answering right. questions, telling people to turn it off and on again, or whatever it is that is needed. One of my favorite cases of that was when I worked in a company that had a debit card for kids. For those of you who might have a Monzo card or something like that, imagine that for eight-year-olds. And so we had crying children who would phone us up saying, I can't use my card. I'm here. I'm hungry. I can't get something at McDonald's. And I put my crustiest least friendly, non-social, only grunting system admin on the phone. He melted. He was the friendliest guy ever. He loved putting money on their card so that they could buy something McDonald's and make them laugh and get really excited. 
And that helped him and others to understand what those customers really needed. So the more you can get the direct contact with real changes, real updates, real things happening, marketing to market, then you get a really magical result for your engineers having conversations with customers. Now I can almost imagine the project managers and the prop managers doing a double take because it's primarily in their domain. <laughs> oh, yes. That definitely drives them bananas. And they say, why on earth are you letting these people do that? I say, the next time you have a conversation with them about what to build, they will have new ideas for you. They will understand this customer. They'll understand what their challenges are and why, for example, for an eight-year-old, it's very difficult to remember a complicated password. Otherwise, they're going to tell you all the security best practices that mean it should be 12 characters and contain three symbols and whatever else. When they actually talk to some eight-year-olds, they realize eight-year-olds are not ready to do that. That was the sort of benefit that we got from, from that kind of interaction. And I do that again and again with my customers. Sure. Now, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're actually suggesting perhaps a deeper look at the organization in that you're always wanting to create a different culture, a very customer-centric kind of culture, which would not already exist right across the organization. Now, that's a very difficult conversation to have as a polite way of saying it. It also can be very And a lot of people think they have that culture. So yep. a lot of people, oh, yes, we're customer-centric. They carve it in stone on the wall. And then what they actually do is have some developers in a faraway country who <laughs> have never talked to the people that actually use the software, build something for them, and then wonder why it's not what they want. Absolutely. And it's also something that is perhaps very close to the heart of a founder or a CEO. So again, how do you broach this idea of culture and it being an issue that needs to be re-examined and perhaps codified to, to an extent, if I'm hearing you correctly? Well, you always work backwards. So I was, again, just coaching someone on this today. He was saying, how do I set my medium term goals for the tech organization? I said, don't set any goals that are just for the tech organization. You need to understand what the whole company is trying to achieve. I'll often have people write it on a napkin. You have to make sure it's very small, compact, has some errors in it, but good enough that you can understand. Our goal is to expand across Europe and to get into as many countries as possible. When you understand that, you can look at what the barriers are. If those barriers include, we don't understand what people need in Eastern Europe, we only know our Western European customers, then that leads to a very natural cultural change. Very obvious what we need to alter. We need to be talking to more of our customers and maybe some of us should learn Polish. It becomes evident what you need to do. Then it becomes a challenge to actually execute that. So the, the sort of thing that I ask people to do there is to be a broken record, repeat very frequently what the new strategy is. We're going to talk to our customers and translate into their languages, for example. That might be a message that you give. And you want to be repeating that in every forum, every place you can to create the cultural change and help people to align to it. The way you know you've done it enough is when somebody says, Vinay, don't say that again. I understand I need to translate into my customers' languages. I'm already learning Romanian. Don't worry. Once they've got that, they've heard it enough. They've internalized it. So then it becomes part of the, the fabric of the company. This is easier to say than to do, but I've helped an awful lot of companies do it. The culture is very much customer-centric or people-driven. Dri We've talked about culture. How does that translate to the kinds of conversations and the emotional elements that we started talking about earlier on of trust and fear and things of that nature? You need to have the trust and fear conversations in order to have effective cultural change. If you have a company that's full of fear and terrified of you, the CEO, for example, you going around and saying, we need to do this may have a great effect. It may be that people cower and hide under the desk and say, okay, I'll do what the big scary boss says to do, but they aren't going to do it very effectively. They won't do it creatively. They won't do it with energy and thoughtfulness. If you have an environment of mistrust and fear, you got to deal with that before you try making any major cultural changes. That's the first foundation to set. Right. For... A CEO, like you described, he or she might be very aware of the fact that they're actually creating in the, in the lives of people in that no one's actually giving them any feedback. So it's one of the loneliest jobs to have, <laughs> as a CEO or founder. Absolutely. How would you suggest that they start to get the right kind of feedback? Because at the moment, there's no one who's willing to have an honest conversation with the CEO. It's quite a trap that, first of all, you'd suspect something was going wrong if your cultural initiatives, if your attempts to change how the organization behaves, fall flat. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying that kind of thing and you're out there being a broken record, repeating something, 
encouraging a new direction and people salute, but then undermine you or don't understand and need many repetitions or don't act, say yes and don't act, then you should suspect that there's something like this going on. And it's hard to know what it is. You can ask trusted lieutenants. You can ask people within the organization who might be a little closer to you and more willing to give you feedback. You can ask someone from the outside. So I do this kind of assessment and I can certainly talk to your people and find out. And there are lots of people like me as well who do this kind of thing. You can go and ask people within the organization yourself. That can be particularly challenging if there's an element of fear, but not too uncommonly. There, there's a couple of brave souls who will tell you. And if the issue is more trust rather than fear, it tends to be that they're more willing to tell you because they, they don't think you're going to beat them up. They just mm. think that you aren't really interested. So when you show up and say, I'm actually interested, you get some very interesting feedback. So there's three ways to do it. Okay. And brilliant ideas that once you've figured out fear to be an issue, how do we start to address it? It's certainly one thing to make the CEO, as per the example that we were using before, aware of it. Being able to change the way they communicate and vice versa with the employees being able to communicate to the CEO obviously needs to change. This kind of change perhaps doesn't come very easily or quickly. Um, it, it doesn't about... necessarily need to change. So it, the thing I advise about fear is you can't get rid of it. So it, it's not like you could go around to everybody's brains and sort of how remove the neurons that are in charge of fear. Human beings have a certain level of fear. The good news is that we deal with fear all the time. So for example, we have a healthy fear that when we cross the street, a car might hit us. But we mitigate that. We will watch for a light to change. We look both ways. We listen to hear whether the car is coming. But if we lost that fear, and there are people who actually have a disease where that fear doesn't work, and they get hit by cars because they don't look both <laughs> ways because they get it's all going to be fine. Yeah. That's not healthy. That's not a good idea. What you do is you look to mitigate the fear, reduce the fear by changing the conversations that people are having. For example, if you have a forceful, creative idea generating, overbearing CEO personality, you're unlikely to change that person into a, a quiet consensus builder. That person is just not going to become different. However, what that person can do is create structures and discussable topics and say, look, if I'm being overbearing, here's some things that you can do. Here's some ways that you can handle that. Here's a process that we're going to use that will show that Although I might give you three ideas, you only have to do one of them because they have to pass through this, this process of leaven, leavening and filtering. There are lots of things you can do in concert with the people who are experiencing the fear to reduce the fear, but you're never going to get rid of it. There's, the main thing is to have a conversation about it and discuss where the fear comes from and what would do, reduce it. Once you do that, you generally have a plan of action that's very effective. The, the other issues, of course, trust. Is that sorted? The structures, there's obviously an element of communication as well. How does that work? Yep. So structure, it always wants, you always want to have the structure follow the conversation. Mm -hmm. You want to do the conversation first. And for trust, the most important thing is to, as I was saying before, to understand the other person's story. And there's a whole mechanism, which is called the ladder of inference for developers. I call it the test driven development process for people. So they have a process with computers. All us engineers, we like talking to computers. They're so predictable. But there's a way that you can talk to a computer in a way that helps you understand what the computer is doing. It takes you very slowly through a sequence of steps. So you can say, okay, it's doing this and then it's doing that. Oh, and here's the problem. And this is how you feel when you're having this ladder of inference, test-driven development for people for a conversation. You're taking yourself and you're forcing yourself to go slower, taking yourself from the data that the person observes to what that data means, to what their assumptions are about that data, to what conclusions they drew, all the way up to what action they took. And typically you can only see what data might have gone in and then what action came out and not having the pieces in between, which happen inside the person's head means that you can't have an effective conversation with them. You can just argue with them about the result. For example, if you have, I'll take, use my example from before, an engineer who says the best security practice is to have really long passwords that change every three days. And that's what we have to do. That's her action, right? That she's mm -hmm. concluding that's the right thing to do. But there's a whole chain of reasoning that got her to that. And if you can understand that at some point her boss told her that any security incident would mean the end of the company, then you would understand that the person to talk to is not her, it's her boss. Mm -hmm. But you can't know that when you just see her insisting that you have to impose a draconian security policy. And therefore, you're not going to trust her and she's not going to trust you 
when you just have a debate about whether users can remember 15 mm -hmm. character passwords. What you need to do is understand the story that lies behind that. And you, anybody can learn to do this. It is a skill. It's something you need to practice and work on, drill, fail at, and get better at. But even doing it bad really helps you to understand what is behind the other person's actions. And that precisely is what builds trust. How would you unpack this, this test driven process for understanding humans? Because just listening to you, I'm detecting that your empathetic potential needs to be pretty high in order to do this effectively. And it actually it's doesn't. Not... It's surprising. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So it's amazing. That's why I can teach it to engineers because we're not known as great empaths. Okay. My, my exactly. wife would confirm this, that reading what somebody else is feeling, we're not so good at that. If you're figuring yeah. out why a computer going beep and giving you error 12, we can do that. Understanding people's feelings, well, it's not our strongest suit, but there's a structured process you can use, which anybody can use, whether you're super right. empathic or not. And that sounds like this. Vinay, can you, can you tell me what you observed that led you to decide your podcast should be about 40 minutes in length? And, what's, and when you observed that, maybe that people respond well to that length, what was important about it to you? Okay. And what did that mean for you? Okay. And so then what did you conclude from those observations? And you keep going through those questions and you notice how slow that is, not mm -hmm. finding out the reason for whatever it was yeah. I said I wanted to find out from you the story I wanted to understand that I might disagree with you about. I'm going to find that out slowly, but in a structured way. And so I don't actually have to guess at your feelings or know how you're feeling ahead of time. I might not be good at that, mm -hmm. but if I get it explicit and I follow these steps, I can actually get an awful lot of information about both how you're feeling and what reasoning led to your actions. And those two things together help me to have a conversation with you that's based on trust, that's based on us each understanding the other's story. And a very useful tool indeed to help increase anyone's empathetic potential, even if they're interested in the topic. That's brilliant. Now, Simon Sinek is obviously well done for this idea of starting with why. It was interesting that you brought up the issues of fear and trust and didn't start with why, which is often Indeed. a rallying cry for many organizations, though. Absolutely. They start with something that people aren't ready to hear yet. Well, so I think Cenex has a, gr a great kind of hook there that means that we, sh we should, before we start getting into the execution, things like accountability and commitment, we, we should deal with why we're doing whatever it is we're doing. I agree with him. He's just missed some things at the beginning, which are, if people aren't ready to listen, if they're terrified of you, if they're mistrustful and they think that you're misleading them, telling them why isn't going to help them at all. Assuming that you've built the foundations and addressed a fear built uh, trust, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, trust is an ongoing thing that needs to be addressed. It's not a one-off. So assuming we've got the bridges being built, when is an appropriate time to start talking about why and how should we leverage it in order to motivate and encourage people? Certainly the most important, the most helpful thing, and maybe not the most important, the most helpful thing is to package it as, as simply and in as uh, compact a way as possible. And that's why I have people write their strategy on a napkin, they, because a lot of really brilliant ideas have been invented on napkins because people are sat in a restaurant somewhere, they're struck with an idea and they write it down. My German clients were telling me that in Germany, they have a, a coaster for beer called a beer decal. And so they have the same concept that they say, you write it on the beer coaster. All of that would be fine. The crucial thing is that when you have your explanation for what you're trying to do so small, it will fit there. It, it means that you have a deeper understanding of it. When you have some broad strategy document that's 50 pages long and nobody reads it and it's gathering dust on the shelf, that means you haven't understood what your strategy is. When you can boil it down to something that anyone can carry around in his or her head, then you've got something that's actually valuable. You've got an understanding that is communicable to others and which clarifies the situation for you. One of the most valuable things to do is to get your why from a vague, complicated description that might take up pages and con confuse everybody. You want it to fit on one slide. Okay. Oh, what's the slide being the equivalent of a napkin, Mizumi? Indeed, something small, okay. right? You want it to be, to, to be captured in a simple way that everyone can remember and carry around with them. It means you've understood it better. A lot of people talk about sharing the why with an origin story, usually by the founder or, or their personal story, which led to the creation or the journey that they're on right now. Your, what would be your take? 
So it's not important to have those, those are dangerous. Or... Yeah, they're nice to have. A lot of companies have them. The danger is they don't change because they're historical. So they always sit there in the past. And we can all think of origin stories. We know Wozniak and, and Jobs in the garage, Mark Zuckerberg in his dorm room at Harvard. We know these stories. But the problem is the business has moved on an awful, long, an awful lot since that origin. They tend to be inflexible. What I prefer is a process of joint design. Again, one of these processes, something you can learn and apply, which allows you to involve people today in helping to design the why and helping to understand it. That doesn't mean, by the way, that you have to build a consensus and play guitar and sing Kumbaya and so on. It doesn't mean that you have to become a complete democracy. You can still have very firm decision making. That's perfectly good. But you want to involve the people who have more information than you do across the organization and have more current information than your origin story might give them. And there's a whole process that I can talk about for effectively doing that in a time boxed way with a clear decision maker that includes everybody so they can all say, yeah, and I was part of designing this and I know why we're doing it and how we're getting to it and I'm ready to execute. Please, I'd love to hear more on that. Sure. So the first thing you want to do is make sure that all the relevant people turn up. And that means that you're much broader than you might think. And the typical thing in an engineering team is somebody says, oh, yes, we'll get the senior engineers. And I say, you need the people who just joined. You need the people in quality. And you need the product managers. You need more voices because those people will have a different way of looking at the situation. Then you need to actually bring them into the conversation. So you want to solicit opposing views and ask genuine questions. So if I say, Vinay, you're running this podcast so that you can get more people to know you and to to increase your fame. Isn't that right? I'm not asking you a genuine question. I'm asking you a very leading question, which sounds like I'm a lawyer, right? And a lawyer might say, if we rip something from the headlines, now, Mr. Trump, you were in the the department store and you were up to no good with this woman, weren't you? Because the the lawyer is trying to make a point. The lawyer is trying to argue something and not trying to get new information, doesn't want to be surprised. You want the opposite. You want to say something like, it seems to me that this might be the reason why we'd approach it this way, but there may be other views, and I'd be really interested in those. And I think you, Vinay, might have a different point of view. Can you tell me more about that? That's a genuine question, encouraging something that's surprising that might really change your point of view. No, we shouldn't go into Eastern Europe. They don't have enough money to buy our product. We should be going into China instead. If you were to learn, that would be really helpful. So you're looking for those moments of surprise during this joint design process. And then, as I said, you want to have a clear decision maker and you want to have a time box so you don't get into endless discussion. And at some point you might say, these are all great ideas. We're going to do number three and we're going to adjust it with the idea that Vinay brought in. Uh, We're going to try that for a month and let's see how it works. At that point, I often say, and if it doesn't work, I will buy everyone a beer. I have never had to buy everyone a beer, (laughs) but it's the kind of thing that will get people to say at the end. She listened to me. She really paid attention to the ideas that I had. I think we're not going quite the right direction. But I certainly had a chance to share what I thought, and I'm willing to try the direction that we came up with together. It's very different. Well, corporate decided we were going to do this. Home office said well, this is the way to do it. The, the CEO has decided this for whatever crazy reason, so we just have to do whatever she says. Right? You want the opposite of that. You want people on board, not necessarily agreeing, but willing to try it. Obviously, well, as you're covering this whole idea of why you're also wanting to build consensus and buy in right across the board which brings up this idea of commitment and ensuring that they not just commit to the overall direction and purpose and that the organization's heading to, but also with the things that they are tasked with or need to, need to solve, if I could put it that way. How does the conversation evolve to address that? Indeed. And by the way, if listeners are paying really close attention, they'll notice that what Vinay is going through is more or less the levels from the uh, five dysfunctions of a team by Lencioni. And that's actually what my co-author and I used in our book, Agile Conversations, as the foundation, because we disagree with Lencioni in various points. And so we said, here's what he misses. He tells you to do this, but doesn't tell you how. Here's the process. Uh, I'm entertained and pleased that you read carefully <laughs> enough to pick up on these approaches. For commitment, uh, what you want, it really goes back to this mark-to-market idea that you want some very clear metrics, which are business meaningful. And that's what people miss so often. It's so easy to say, oh, we're going to make sure we do this many points in our sprint, or we're going to make sure to phone this many customers in our sales teams. They look at the inputs or the the easy to measure items rather than the outputs Mm -hmm. and the results for the business. And if you make people responsible and have them make commitments to the business outcomes, they often do things that are very surprising to you. And I've had engineers 
who go over and help in training because they say, look, the biggest problem isn't that we build the wrong features, it's that nobody understands how to use them. So if you tell me that what you want is greater satisfaction scores, the way I can do that is to stop writing code and to go over there and help the training folks teach people how to use it right because nobody understands it. And then I can come back and make it easier to use once I understand what the problems are. Now, that's not a typical developer behavior, but that's not because engineers aren't capable of it. It's because we don't incentivize them the right way and we don't ask them to make the right commitments. That's an interesting perspective. Are you suggesting that we examine the whole idea of doing sprints and being agile and things of that nature? Or I think we, it would be good if we got back to what it was actually <laughs> uh, first about. So if you go back and read something called the Agile Manifesto, yeah. where the term came from is a, a bunch of folks who were doing stuff like this and got together at a ski resort. I think they were snowed in and so they didn't have anything to do other than write this <laughs> manifesto. They had to agree on something. Uh, they, if you go back and look at that, it's all about customer results. It's all about getting progress rather than following a plan. And th those things are very effective. The problem is that the bureaucrats got hold of it and they gave us things like Scrum, which encourage us to follow these ritualistic processes that produce the numbers you were talking about before, and that there, there is safety in numbers and that's dangerous. We don't want to be safe. We don't want to be comfortable. We want to be surprised and we want people to be creative and we want to get, uh, get somewhere else. I forget the question, but you got me going on agile. Oh, uh, with, whether we should be focused yeah. on these sort of uh, ritual processes. No. However, there's really valuable things in the idea of having some kind of frequent iteration and marking to market by getting the customer feedback and really understanding whether people will pay for whatever it is that you have. If you can get that kind of feedback very quickly, you can adjust fast. That's the true meaning of agility. It means I'm able to make an adjustment quickly to whatever the market is telling me. And then you can get a result fast and you can increase your profit and improve your business results. But the danger is that people look for that safety. They're operating from fear and lack of trust. And as a result, what they say is, I'm just going to do the safe thing over here. I'm going to do my mm -hmm. tickets. As long as I do my tickets, that means I'm okay. I'm going to keep my head down. You don't want people with their heads down. So if I remember correctly, I think I read, uh, you talk about elephant departure. Oh, yes. Is, One is, of my favorite what, topics. Is this where it comes in? Oh, of course. You're really well read. Uh, please, you flipped up so much. Many people don't bother. Elephant carpaccio is the idea that you take some big project, some big thing that you want to do. And you slice it so thin, you can see through it. I'm a vegetarian. Carpaccio is not my favorite thing <laughs> in the real world, but it's a great analogy. It is meat sliced so thin that you can hold it up yep. and I can see you through it. And what you're looking to do is to slice the pieces in shapes that look like an elephant. So if I were to take that elephant, just imagine an elephant in your mind. If, if listeners are driving, don't do this too much. You're <laughs> both side for this. But if you imagine the elephant, you imagine slicing it horizontally. At the bottom, you're going to get four feet. And halfway up, you're just going to get a kind of blob. And just at the very top, you're going to get just a little piece for the back, or maybe you'll get some of the tail. So that, that's, none of that is going to look like an elephant. What you want is to slice your elephant so that it's vertical. So at every stage, you get a silhouette of the elephant. You may be missing bits of it, but you have the basic shape of the elephant at all times. And as you build it up, as you add more slices, it becomes more and more like an elephant. So how you do that in software is you might release a version of the software which has a button that doesn't do anything. But the button's in the right place and it says the right thing. It says, try new feature X. And then you count how many people click the button. This is called mm. the painted door because it's painted on the wall. You can't go through yeah. it. But you see how many people try. And then when you click it, you might actually show a picture of what is going to be there. So you say, oh, look, this you can't interact with this. Where are you clicking? Then you see what people actually you make some piece of that work and you see what people do with it. But at every stage, it looks like the feature. What developers will often do is they slice their elephants horizontally and they'll come to you and say, great, we've done the database index. You say, I'm not sure what that is, but okay. When they say, great, we're 10% done. Oh yeah, we're 20% done. We've built the business logic. Okay, again, I don't know what that is. I can't see anything. Doesn't look like an elephant. Maybe it's okay. This is how engineering projects take months and years more than they're supposed to and never build what they're supposed to because no one looks. You can't mark to market. You can't see what the results are. And so Elephant Carpaccio is a process for releasing new software, ideally every single day. And then every day you see a tiny advancement and you can always see whether you're headed the right direction. You can do this in almost any industry. It's not necessarily daily, but I've even got biotech firms who are building things for medical environments who can release new software every two weeks. And that's revolutionary and fast in that environment. So no matter what industry you're in, 
you can get to this level of, of feedback and that's tremendously valuable. That's a, a incredibly interesting idea. I don't think too many people talk about it. No. Uh, but uh, it makes a lot of sense. So essentially you're saying that, I'm trying to put it in a different way here, you're always encouraging software developers to build a wireframe and build it out on that wireframe to make uh, That would be one of many elements. ways to do it. Absolutely. But the wireframe okay. should be visible. It should be understandable. Yeah. Here's another way I did it once. I had a, a hedge fund, essentially. It was a different type of fund, but same kind of thing. The, the kind of people who have billions and billions of dollars that they're managing. And so they have these spreadsheets that were full of errors, but also full of absolutely gigantic numbers with more zeros than you can imagine. And we were replacing this with a web-based system. We were building it so that they could see it in a browser. And what we did first was we literally copied by taking the numbers. We took the individual numbers and we put them on a page statically. So it was always 17. Of course, in the real world, that number was changing all the time as they traded in the market. But we showed it to them as a static page. And we said, look, none of these numbers are correct today. They were right yesterday when we copied them over. Can you look at them and tell us what you think? And they said, this number's wrong and this one's wrong. And they said, okay, that's right from your spreadsheet. So obviously your spreadsheet's mm -hmm. wrong. So that helped us get a lot of feedback. And then we made one of the numbers work. We said, well, this one's going to be the sum of those two because you told us that's what it should be. And they said, oh yeah, except not on Thursdays. And yeah, when the moon is full, no, it shouldn't be. And we got all the rules for that one. And then we said, okay, let's have the next one work and the next one work and the next one work. So it always looked like the system they were going to have, just some of the numbers were not changing. And right. then we had more and more of them change. So it actually worked the way they wanted to. And that was a wonderful way to get tons of feedback very quickly and for them to see the progress and to tell us where we were off. Right. And finally, of course, is this idea of accountability and ensuring that everyone's committing to what they say they will do. How does that conversation occur? So the thing is that many people talk about holding someone accountable. And whenever mm -hmm. someone talks about holding someone else accountable, I want to hide under my desk because I don't want to be held accountable. That sounds dangerous. <laughs> sounds like I'm going to be in trouble. I prefer to talk about being accountable because the idea originally comes from tax collectors, sheriffs in the old medieval times, like the medieval house I live in, that they would have to account for, give a numbering of the taxes they had collected. Mm -hmm. And they went to the king and said, here's the amount I collected. And they'd hand over actual bags of pennies and say, here's the amount that, that I've collected. That's the sort of thing you want your engineers doing or anybody else in the organization. And you can give them a structure for doing that. The structure I like to use comes actually from the Prussian military, believe it or not. And it was written about in a book by Stephen Bungay, who's a military historian and a consultant. What a great combination. And he, he describes this process of briefing and back briefing, which is used in military organizations to this day. Uh, the idea is that I tell you, Vinay, here are the goal that we're trying to achieve, the constraints that you need to follow. So don't go over budget and don't involve the accounts team or, or something else. I give you some constraints. And then some freedoms. We can approach it with any method you'd like. You can outsource it. You can use the team that you have. You can train people in something new. And then the crucial thing is that I want you to come back and be accountable to me as soon as possible. So that the mistake people often make with the back briefing, which comes next, I've completed my briefing to you. I'm ready for you to go forth and do it. But they say, okay, great. I'll see you in a month. And the problem is you can go make an awful lot of mistakes in a month. There's not enough feedback. So instead, what you want is the feedback to come back maybe the next day, maybe that afternoon. Before the person has a chance to make any of the mistakes, they come back and they say, yes, I'm going to do this. It's only going to be a little bit over budget and I'm going to be doing this. You say, well, hang on a second. I said, you can't go over budget. Go back and replan. Once they right. come to you with a good enough one, then you set up an accountability mechanism so that they can continually back brief you and tell you where they are on the project. And the wonderful thing about this is once you brief someone, you as the leader can forget about it knowing that the back briefing is coming soon. So you can say, great, brief Vinay. I'm going to hear about it on Thursday. I don't have to th think about it until Thursday. And that really clears up your own mind and your own ability to scale it yourself. You mentioned the accountability mechanism. Is that it or is there more to, to the mechanism? I prefer to keep things simple. <laughs> so yes, that's it. Uh, okay. you do that over and over again with all the people who report to you. You'll be amazed how much more time you have to think strategically and try to solve the, the larger business problems and the, how effective they're able to be because you're giving them appropriate levels of autonomy, mm -hmm. but making sure that they can be accountable back to you. Once you've got all the other elements like uh, trust and fear addressed, they understand why they're doing it. There's a mechanism for commitment. Then this is a cherry on top. It makes your life much simpler and you don't have to worry about what many non-technical founders tell me over and over again man, I don't understand all this tech stuff. I ask them to do something. They come back six months later with the wrong thing. 
if you use all these techniques together, you're marketing to market. So you're seeing the progress. You have back briefings. You don't have to worry about it. And you don't need to learn a bunch of technical language. I love what you're talking about. It also makes sense to me that it's not just a cost center or an, an investment, a huge investment, but given the methodology that you're describing, it's a very tangible, profitable center or profit oriented center. If What's really amazing right. is in software, we have a mechanism for creating stuff that can be infinitely replicated and costs almost nothing to run. Mm. So it's as if you could build a car that was built out of air and ran on, on sunlight. And you say, gosh, I can make an awful lot of those, right? Because <laughs> I've got a lot of air and I can just run it and make a ton of money off it. But what people do, unfortunately, is make the whole cop process so complex, operate from so much fear and, and so much mistrust that they're not able to get all the benefits they can out of software. So that's my mission is to help people see how software can be a profit engine rather than just a cost. I also would pick up on something that I think you mentioned, which is the action science management technique. I'm curious, what is it and where and why do you use it? This is an old idea that I did not originate. It comes from a brilliant person named Chris Argyris, who is an excellent researcher in all things to do with organizational management and running organizations. The problem with him is he couldn't write in English that actual normal humans could understand. So there's very abstruse detailed research that shows that all these things work, things like the genuine questions, the joint design, the accountability, all those things, or many of those things come from his ideas. Unfortunately, he couldn't make them practical for others to use. So there are a bunch of people who have built on that, a guy named Roger Schwartz. There's the, I think it's called the Harvard Negotiation Project. I might have the name wrong. There's a bunch of people who have made a living taking what Arger has discovered and making it actually practical for people to use. And I'm carrying on that tradition of taking it and saying, hey, wait a minute, there's all these wonderful ideas. They really appeal to engineers like test-driven development for people. There's this process you can follow and you can actually understand what someone else is thinking and build trust with them and get to understand their feelings. That's amazing. Unfortunately, it was locked up in academic journals. It's a fantastic system, but needs some interpretation. Okay. If I understand this correctly, it's a toolkit of different methods or processes to do do what we just talked about in detail, is that it? That's right. Okay. And in particular, the overall philosophy is that there, there's a natural way of behaving that people fall back to when they're under threat, when they're under pressure, when the stakes are high. And it's actually the ones that people know are not effective. So these are things like saying, I know the right answer and I need to convince you rather than jointly designing it with you. It, it doesn't matter how we're feeling. What we need to do is be rational. All of these kinds of messages are what people naturally actually do. But if you ask them what would be most effective, they tell you things like we talked about, that those mm. would be better to do. What if we included everybody and we got all their ideas? Well, that would help. Yeah, that would be a good idea. What if we built mitigations for people's fears and made them feel more comfortable? Yeah, that would be a great idea. We definitely should do that, except this one case where it's really important and where I know what to do. So let's all follow me. And unfortunately, people fall in this trap that they naturally yeah. head for this, uh, what's called model, model two approach, this uh, defensive routines. And they would be more effective if they operated from model one. And the techniques, the toolkit is all about how to help you change your conversations so that you operate in that more effective way, even when you're feeling fear, mistrust, you're feeling under threat. Love it. We've covered a fair bit of green, but I'm curious, Douglas, is there perhaps a couple of aspects to this whole idea of building software that you find doesn't get much airtime, doesn't get talked about very much? If so, what would they be? Oh, fascinating. Let me think. We've covered a lot of them. You've asked me excellent questions, so I'm not sure there's anything massively missing. I guess I'd reiterate something I, I brought up before briefly, which is that it's so safe to talk about structure. It's so safe to talk about process. And it's so unsafe to talk about people don't trust me. There's fear in the organization. There's ineffective empathy where people don't understand each other. Well, we're having the wrong conversations. So if you can get to and these techniques help you to get over these difficulties. If you can get yourself and your organization to discuss those undiscussable issues, then you make an awful lot of progress very quickly. The challenge and the reason I'm not going to run out of consulting work is not everybody is ready to do that. It's very challenging to do. They might say they'd like to do it. How to do it is quite challenging. It, there's endless debates about whether we should use the Spotify model or Kanban or Scrum or something else. That gets a lot of airtime. What doesn't get a lot of airtime is how could we have better conversations? Good. And to wrap things up, if, sure. if you were listening to this episode, 
What would you say would be your top takeaway? Oh, great. I think what I just said, which is I the way I can talk, it. I can talk to my engineers <laughs> right. in a yeah. way that doesn't require me to know a lot of technical, technical babble and doesn't yeah. require me to listen to a lot of their complicated technical knowledge, which I'm never going to have. But I can have a conversation with them like I might have with a car mechanic or with a hairdresser or somebody who understands in great detail something I don't is doing a service for me. And I can have a conversation with them about the outcome. And they can mark to market so I know whether there's a result for the end, a result from what they're doing and whether it matches where I want to be. If I held that conversation and then had the accountability, I could actually make a ton out of my technology team. That's what I hope people take away. Brilliant. And for listeners who are curious, want to find out more or connect with you, where would you recommend that they head to? Two, two places. One is douglassquirrel.com. That's where you can read all about me and how I work with people and what I do. You can read about my 600-year-old house that I'm doing this interview in, all kinds of other exciting things. And then there's my free Squirrel Squadron, which you mentioned very kindly before. That's my way of giving back. That's where uh, people get together for conversations about exactly these topics. I was just responding to some on where people really screw up their organizations and work on the wrong things and don't make profit. How can we address that not only in technology, but elsewhere? It's a group of technical and non-technical people getting together. That's the unusual different thing about it, discussing how we can learn from each other, what we can improve and how we can have better conversations. There's free weekly events. There's a forum to discuss. There's weekly emails and videos and more things. So that's at squirrelsquadron.com. I will do links to that in the show notes. Douglas, this has been terrific. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, sir.